So because I don't want you to get in trouble with your spouse or employer, I'm going to keep talking over this scene until she's done making all the noises, and there we go. I'll have what she's having. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're taking a look at the positively orgasmic pastrami from When Harry Met Sally. Now, never mind that Sally appears to be actually eating a turkey sandwich, but also that we're talking about the world-famous pastrami from Katz's, which there's no way we're going to be able to recreate, but at the very least, we can imitate. To do so, I have a whole brisket here that is comprised of two parts, the lean flat and the fatty point. Katz's lets you choose between either or, so we're going to do a little bit of both. You'll notice that I'm cutting the brisket clean down the middle, which is enough to make any butcher shudder. But I'm doing that so I can have a manageable piece that has both flat and point, all in one package that will still fit into my largest curing container. Don't worry, this guy will not go to waste. I will turn him into some Texas-style barbecue. But for my flat and point piece, I'm going to trim away as much excess fat and sinew as I can, still leaving about a half an inch of fat to keep everything moist and fatty. Now it's time to contend with our cure, which we're going to do by weight, using Meathead's curing calculator at AmazingRibs.com. First, an astonishing 1.5 cups, or about 420 grams, of kosher salt, followed by about a tablespoon and a half, or 27 grams of pink curing salt. I'm also going to add three or four crushed bay leaves, maybe about a tablespoon each of coriander seeds and mustard seeds, one tablespoon of allspice berries, two or three sticks of cinnamon broken up to the best of your strength and ability, about two tablespoons of whole peppercorns, one or two teaspoons of whole cloves, four or five dried arbol chilies, and about a tablespoon of juniper berries. Then we gotta add some sweetness. I'm going with about three quarters of a cup, or about 150 grams of dark brown sugar, and whoops, I almost forgot, three cloves of crushed garlic. Now, most recipes call for boiling your brine for safety, but if you start with distilled water, you can skip this step. At least, I think you can. Don't quote me on that. So I'm whisking our sugar and spice and everything nice together with one and one half gallons of distilled water. Tiny Whisk was neither available nor willing to participate in this task. Once everybody is good and dissolved, it's time to drop in our brisket and to make sure that it stays submerged, we're gonna weigh it down with a plate or bowl or whatever you got that's heavy, food safe, and won't leach anything into the water. Then this guy's headed into the fridge for at least five and up to 10 days, only emerging once every other day to be flipped to ensure even brine exposure. Then on day 10, we're taking it on a field trip to my house, because that is where I keep my smoker. Now, Katz's cures their pastrami for a month, smokes it for three to four days, and then boils it for four to six hours. Now, we obviously can't do that, so I'm going to try two different methods of cooking this brisket, turning it first into corned beef and then into pastrami. Now, remember, we have two different parts of the brisket here. We have the lean flat and the fatty point, because of their vastly different volumes of fat and connective tissue that makes them excellent candidates for two different cooking methods. So I'm going to carefully separate them, trimming off any excess remaining fat or silver skin, and then I think the point or fatty cut is going to respond better to the traditional boiling. In order to keep the lean flat, nice and tender, I think it's a better candidate for sous vide. So after thoroughly rinsing both cuts in an effort to desalinate them, we're placing the point in a large stock pot and covering it with a few inches of water. We're bringing that to a boil and keeping it there at a gentle simmer covered for three to four hours. The flat we're going to place in a vacuum sealing bag. And then after thoroughly scrubbing my brining container, I'm going to fill it halfway with water, drop in the brisket, set my sous vide to 180 degrees, cover it with plastic wrap, and let it go for at least 10 hours or until extremely tender but not falling apart. The next day, remove the bag from the water, remove the fat from the bag, and dump out your homemade corned beef. As you can see, both of these cuts have gone from a pallid gray to a lovely pink, but they are not rare. This is a result of the pink curing salt, and they are extraordinarily tender. This is what you want to see muscle fiber separation, not falling apart, not mushy, just dastardly tender. But corned beef is merely the chrysalis from which the pastrami butterfly emerges. Ugh. Into a spice grinder, I'm combining about three tablespoons each coriander seeds and black peppercorns, grinding until just cracked, not fully ground, and dumping into a bowl along with a tablespoon of white sugar, and then some optional flavor add-ins, a tablespoon of sweet paprika to awaken the mind, a teaspoon of garlic powder for the soul, a teaspoon of onion powder for the heart, and a teaspoon of mustard powder for the 
loins. Mix this guy all together and rub it thoroughly upon your beefs. Make sure your beef is warm or run it under some warm water for a few seconds to make sure that the spice rub adheres. Don't worry so much about the sides, it's most important to get the top and bottom. Then out onto a 225 degree Fahrenheit smoker it goes, loaded to bear with cherry wood and hickory. Once these guys are placed, you can smoke them for anywhere from one to four hours, depending on how much smoky flavor you want and how robust of a bark you want on the exterior. Me, I want lots of both of those things, so I'm going for the full four. Once your pastrami emerges from the smoker, let it rest at room temperature for about 10 minutes before carving and serving. You could also steam it for a few hours for extra tenderness and to further imitate Katz's method, but I think you'll find that after all the love we've given it, it's extraordinarily tender, juicy, and flavorful. And it is primed and ready to make a sandwich. Upon looking at pictures of Katz's after this, I realized that I'm cutting mine way too thick. So just a heads up, my sandwich is not going to look totally legit, but it's going to taste totally legit, stacked high atop two slices of Jewish rye. Make sure you stack it really, really high. Katz's tends to test the theoretical limits of structural integrity in sandwiches. Slice it in half, and there you have it, folks. Some true blue homemade pastrami, served as God intended on untoasted rye with lots and lots of spicy brown mustard, and an unreasonable amount of garlic dill and half-sour pickles at your disposal. And I was worried about the thick slices being chewy, but they're so tender it hardly makes a difference how thick you slice it. This pastrami is silky and soft without being mushy, profoundly flavorful, and completely worthy of all the food shaking of approval that I'm doing. I'm gonna go ahead and induct this bad boy into the clean plate club off camera. Trust me, you do not want to see my Meg Ryan impression. 